a new discovery happened in 1963. An E. coli fish was discovered from the Manish Silver System. It named as M13 fish. M13 fish is a long rod filament that is approximately 880 nanometer in length and 6.6 nanometer in width. It is also known as a single-strand DNA virus that belongs to the inoviral family of filamentous bacterial phages, which they will infect the gram-negative bacteria. M13 phage has the advantage of being able to reproduce within the infected host without causing the cell lysis. Currently, M13 bacterial phage has been extensively investigated, and much is now known about its biochemical. Biophysical and genetic characteristics. It is one of the smallest filamentous bacteriophage, known with a size 6,407 nucleotides, and it is smaller than the lambda phage. Structurally, the M13 phage consists of five different proteins, which include the minor code proteins. You can see that a yellow mushroom-like structure that is referred to the P3. Besides that. You can see a red color mushroom-like structure, is known as the P6, followed by P7, P9, and the major capsid protein P8. The phage predominantly consists of 2,700 copies of the P8 protein, encoded by the gene egg with four to five copies of the minor code proteins capping each end. Early researchers demonstrated that the curved protein surface of the M13 phage could be genetically modified by incorporating the foreign DNA fragments into the phage genome. You might wonder when and who made the M13 phage become famous. The story began in 1985. A chemist known as George P. Smith had discovered something found on M13 phage. Smith and other researchers have first described the phage display technique. He displayed peptides on the filamentous phage by fusing the peptide of interest onto the cup protein gene tree of M13. Once the specific protein sequence is successfully inserted into the gene tree, it causes the protein to be expressed, and you can find more and more protein on the outside of the M13 phage. Since this important discovery, M13 phage has been used widely for displaying various peptide ligands. For use in biological investigations, such as gene-specific antibodies, the use of M13 also includes the ssDNA foam probes, or cloning, and subcloning experiment. After that, let's briefly talk about the construction of M13 cloning vector. So this is the M13 phage containing ten closely packed genes, as shown here. In order to construct the vector, let's focus on here. Let me quickly draw this out. Okay, the first step now is to introduce the like D gene into the intergenic sequence using the restriction enzyme and ligase. This would give rise to M13 MP1. After that, our problem now is that M13 MP1 does not have any unique restriction sites in the like D gene. Actually, it does, but it's GGATTC. Slightly different with that of the echo R1 restriction site. So the second step is to alter it with in vivo mutagenesis. So this is our product now. The hexanucleotide becomes GAATTC, which is an echo R1 site. We call this as M13MP2. After that, the next step is to introduce additional restriction sites into the like D gene. This can be achieved by adding in the polylinker. A polylinker is a short DNA sequence that contains two or more different sites for the cleavage of the restriction enzymes. So the polylinkers are introduced into the vectors to make the cloning easier by providing the sites that allow the cloning of the DNA. Finally, we got our product. We call it as M thirteen MP seven vector. Next, let's talk about the unique features of M thirteen cloning vector. Firstly. Smaller size of M13 cloning vector. This is M13 vector. It has relatively smaller size of only 6.4 kb, while this is lambda bacterial phage. Its size is 49 kb. So the smaller size of M13 vector actually offers convenience in terms of manipulation purpose. Secondly, double-stranded DNA behaves very much like a plasmid. 
M13 phage is single-stranded, but when they are injected into E. coli, their replication form is double-stranded. This replication form, or RF, behaves very much like a plasmid. For instance, RF can be digested with restriction endonuclease, then the insert can be cloned in. Thirdly, the clone gene in single-stranded is useful. After infecting E. coli, the gene cloned with M13 base vector can be single-stranded. Single-stranded versions of clone genes are very useful for thorough techniques, notably DNA sequencing, in vivo mutagenesis, or other techniques that require single-stranded DNA. Lastly, M13 vector is easily prepared. The M13 vector can be prepared by just infecting E. coli cells. After that, it can also be reintroduced with transfection. The transfection is to artificially introduce M13 DNA into E. coli using different methods, for example, microinjection. The replication strategy of M13. Firstly, M13 DNA molecule is injected into E. coli via pylus, the structure that connects two cells during sex conjugation. Once inside the cell, the replication form or RF is synthesized using the single-stranded M13 DNA or the positive strand as a template. Then, the complementary strand produced is called negative strand. After that, the RF replicates to produce multiple copies of itself inside the host. Then, RF may replicate by rolling circuit mechanism to produce linear single-stranded DNA. Eventually, new phage particles are continuously assembled and released about 1,000 new phages being produced during each generation of an infected cell. All in all, in the replication strategy of M13, it follows a simpler infection cycle than lambda in a way that it does not need genes for insertion into the host genome. Moreover, the infection cycle of M13 is lysogenic, since they are able to reproduce within the infected host without causing cell lysis. Now, let's see how we can utilize M13 phage for amplification of gene. The amplification of gene using M13 phage can be separated into six parts. The first one is to isolate the gene of interest. The second is to insert the gene of interest into the M13 phage. The third is to grow bacteria culture. The fourth is to infect bacteria culture with recombinant plasmid. Then, we will screen the positive recombinants. And lastly, we will isolate the amplified genes. In the first step, the gene of interest is being isolated. The targeted cells which contain the gene of interest is being lysed by using centrifuge in order to release the cell content. Then, gel electrophoresis of the supernatant was carried out to isolate the gene of interest at specific band. After isolating the gene of interest, the next step is to insert the gene of interest into the M13 phage. Well, how can this be done? In fact, both gene of interest and the M13 phage must be digested with the same restriction enzyme. The gene of interest is digested at a specific site producing a blue digested plasmid whereas the M13 phage is digested by the restriction enzyme at the gene coding for LAC-Z gene, producing the red digested plasmid. Then, both the blue and the red plasmid are ligated with ligase, producing a recombinant plasmid. The third step is to grow E. coli culture. However, there are a wide variety of E. coli strains out there. So, which one should we choose? This is a diagram of M13 phage. And in order for M13 phage to infect an E. coli cell, the E. coli cell must have a structure known as the F. pilus, to which the M13 phage absorbs before penetrating into the E. coli cell. Therefore, it is essential for host strains to carry the F. pilus. Examples of E. coli strains with F. pilus are TG1, JM101, and JM109. Let's use TG1 as an example and grow the E. coli culture of TG1. 
Moving on to the next step, after growing a culture of E. coli strain TG1, in fact, the culture by incubating the bacterial culture with the recombinant plasmid, which contains gene of interest and M13 phage. After incubation at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, the bacterial culture should be well infected with the recombinant plasmid. The subsequent step is to screen for positive recombinant. This can be done by carrying out the blue-white screening. As mentioned earlier on, the gene of interest is inserted into the part of M13 phage, which is responsible in coding of LAXZ gene. So how does this help in the screening process? LAXZ gene encodes for an enzyme known as the beta-galactosidase, which cleaves lactose into glucose and galactose. The insertion of a foreign DNA into M13 phage at the gene coding for LAXZ will result in inactivation of the beta-galactosidase marker. Recombinant M13 phages can easily be identified from a background of non-recombinant M13 phages by their color on media containing IPTG and XGAL. IPTG is a non-metabolized analog of galactose that induces the expression of LAXZ gene. Whereas, XGAL is a chromogenic substrate for visual screening purposes. Well, how do XGAL eat in visual screening then? In a non-recombinant cell, LAXZ gene is not inactivated and thus the beta-galactosidase can be produced. The beta-galactosidase will hydrolyze the X-gal in the agar medium and forming a blue pigment. The colonies formed by non-recombinant cells therefore appear in blue color, while the recombinant ones will appear in white. Hence, the desired positive recombinant colonies can be easily picked and cultured. Moving on to the final step, which is to isolate the amplified gene from the positive recombinant. The first thing to do is to grow an infected positive recombinant M13 E. coli culture. Then, centrifuge the bacterial culture. After centrifugation, the supernatant will contain the recombinant M13 phage and the supernatant was incubated with M13 precipitation buffer in order to precipitate the M13 phage. After that, centrifuge the precipitated M13 phage to lyse the M13 phage. The supernatant was centrifuged again before isolating the DNA with silica spin column. Lastly, gel electrophoresis of the extracted DNA was carried out to isolate the gene of interest at specific band. And here you go, the amplified genes using the M13 phage and E. coli were isolated. Well, that is all from us. We hope you get to learn from our video. Thank you.